So, all right, take your Bible, turn to John chapter 1. It's been a while since we've been here on Wednesday night. I had to look to see what the last lesson was that I uh, had taught on Wednesday night. And um, by the way, for those of you who get our mail out packets, um, what we're going to do is we're going to combine September and October all together. Um, September the 20th was about the last sermon I preached here um, before I came down sick. So we have part of September and then we have the rest of September. There's nothing that happened. Uh, the first part of October, nothing happened. And so what we're simply going to do is we're going to combine both of those months together and put them on. We send out um, a Sunday sermon DVD with all the Sunday sermons that we preach that month on there. We send out a disc of Watchman video broadcasts that were done that month. And then we send out an MP3 disc. I'm not going to try to explain that. But instead of getting, let's say, 20 songs or 20 audio files on a regular CD, you can get as many as four, five, six hundred um, on one, and it has to do with compression. And again, I'm not going to get into all that, but most car CD players will play that now. DVD players will play it. Um, your computer, pop in your computer, you can play it. Uh, you can move the files off the, your, off the CD onto your computer, store them on your iPhone or your tablet or whatever you want to do with it. Um, and those of you who get that, I encourage you uh, that once you watch them, uh, give them out to somebody. Spread it around a little bit. Let people know. I'll never forget that story of the guy at the laundromat. Um, he was a Roman Catholic, and he's folding his clothes. He's a single man. He's folding all of his clothes, and he sees all these DVDs spread on the folding table. Doesn't know who this guy Mike Hoggart is. So just as he's leaving, he grabs one, puts it on top of his laundry, and he goes home and he watches the disc. I have no idea what disc it was, what the topic was, don't have anything, no idea, anything like that. And all of a sudden, after he watches it, he gets back in his car, goes back to the laundromat, gets every one that's different there, and he takes them home, binge watches them, gives his life to the Lord, goes out and buys a King James Bible, and that's just the power of the Word of God, Amen. which is where we're going tonight. John, not, not this John, John, the Bible John. Do what? After reading John 1? Uh, that's, a good one to, that's a good one to get saved with. The Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Amen? Amen. Um, let's read... Let's read um, down through verse 14, we'll go to prayer. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the same was in the beginning with God. All things were made uh, by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. Was anything made that wasn't made by Christ? No. It says right there, without Him was not anything made that was made. Okay? That includes the largest thing in the universe. That includes the smallest thing in the universe. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness. And the darkness comprehended it not. There was a man sent from, from God whose name was John. Now this is, the, this is the other John. There are two Johns in the Bible. John the Baptist, who was the one crying in the wilderness, prepare you the way of the Lord who died, got his head cut off. And then there is the Apostle John, who was chosen by Jesus himself uh, to be an apostle. And we'll talk about John's life here in a little bit. But in this case, John the Apostle is talking about John the Baptist. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness, to bear witness of the light. Notice the word light, capital L there. That all men through him might believe. He was not that light, again, capital L, 
but was sent to bear witness of that light. Again, capital L. That was the true light. One more time. Which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. I'll maybe later on give an ex my explanation of what I think that means. He was in the world. The world was made by him and the world knew him not. He came into his own and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And then verse 14, and the word was made flesh. I love that. Now, when I get there, I'm going to teach on that. The word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the father, full of grace and truth. Father, we ask your blessings on tonight's service. Thank you, Lord, for gathering us here into your house tonight. Thank you, Lord, for those that are gathered also with us online. We pray for those, Father, that are still sick, those that are still affected. We pray, God, that you'd bless them, open the windows of heaven, pour out many blessings to them. Pray, dear God, that you'd give the, the saints patience as we go through these very, very dark days. Help us, dear God, to follow the true light of Jesus Christ and no other light. Help us, dear God, to not fall for the wiles of the devil. Help us, dear God, to stay away from sin. Pray, dear God, Lord, that you would just bless your people. Forgive us of our sins. We thank you for Jesus, our creator, our God, our Lord, our light, who came into this world to live as we do live, yet without sin. And so, Father, we'll follow him all the days of our life because of the examples that he made, the life that he lived. We just pray, dear God, that you would enlighten our minds and our hearts tonight with your word, with the holy word. We ask your blessings on tonight's teaching. We pray this in Jesus' name and all the God's people said, amen. Notice, uh, going back to John 1, you know, I've made a point of this several times, but the, um, what, the time that I spent with uh, Brady Crum, who used to come here years ago, came out of the Jehovah's Witness Church. And I noticed uh, from having the Jehovah's Witness on my porch a few times, they're pretty good at what they're doing, them and the Mormon missionaries. And I would say this, um, unless you really feel led of the Lord to uh, engage these people, to talk to them, to try to witness to them somehow, I want to caution you against it. And number one, most Mormon missionaries, most Jehovah's Witness missionaries generally are never, never, ever, ever converted while they're on your front doorstep, while they're in your house. Almost never does that take place. I won't say never. I won't say God can't do it. But the fact that um, I went, I didn't stay very long, but I went into a Jehovah's Witness meeting place on a Thursday night one night and you want to talk about feeling a different spirit it was there I was there to apologize to a couple of ladies that had come to my door that I mean I was brutal to those gals uh, probably more than necessary and God was dealing with me about take ye away the stone I had put a stone of offense as it turns out I was at the wrong kingdom hall and uh, but just being in that building just for a little while, I could tell I was surrounded by the enemy. But I noted that in their meeting place, generally there's no windows in a kingdom hall. If you, if you pass by one, look for windows. And there generally aren't any. I don't know why that is. But I noticed that they had, uh, I think their midweek service or whatever is sort of practice run. They have various people go up and they try to convert someone to the Jehovah's Witness religion, um, you know, 
up on the stage. They, they have sort of like a training session where you're the one that is, you're pretending to be someone who's a Jehovah's Witness and you're trying to convince the person sitting across the table from you that they need to be a Jehovah's Witness as well. I worked for a Jehovah's Witness uh, when I was in Bible college. Uh, she ran a little t-shirt kiosk in a mall where she made custom t-shirts and she sold, you know, custom, you could put lettering on them, whatever. And I was really, really bad at that. That's why she fired me. But anyway, um, I sort of took it on as my personal mission to try to witness to this woman. And she caught on very early. She knew I was from the Bible college because it was like right across the highway. And she said, Mike, I'm going to tell you something. She said, I was a Southern Baptist Sunday school teacher for 20 years. And she said, you're not going to change my mind on anything. She had already determined. Or maybe she hadn't. Maybe she was just trying to deflect anything I might have said or just to keep me quiet. But uh, she had already determined, as far as that goes, that she wasn't changing her mind on anything when it comes to the scriptures. They're very, very well indoctrinated. And I noticed that the, the two that I had on my front porch one day, and I was actually studying for a message the next day. I was, going to, I was preaching out at Richwoods, and I noticed that their Bible was really, really thick. And while one person was talking to me, another person was flipping through this Bible that they had. So I figured it was the New World Translation, which is the Jehovah's Witness Translation, but that it must have had something else in it. Because when I would ask a question, I noticed the person holding the book was flipping through and looking like they were looking for the answer to that question. And I, I had since asked Brady that, and he said, yes, you're right. He said, um, he said, part of it is what possible question could be asked by somebody that you're talking to, and here's the answer that we're supposed to give. Now, name something that's wrong with that, right? Name something wrong with that. It eliminates the Holy Spirit, okay? Because the Bible says th don't, don't give any forethought to what you're going to say. But the Jehovah's Witness is like any other cult. It's power and control from the top down. You do what we tell you to do. You say it how we tell you to say it. And you don't vary from that. And I can remember at one time uh, before Brady started coming to church here, he said, would you do me a favor? I said, what? He said... Next time, if they show up to your house, don't let them know you know me. There was fear in his voice over that. And I asked, and I had to kind of figure it out in my mind what would happen. And I asked him later, I said, Brady, when you said that to me, what would they have done to you had they found out that you had been talking to me? He said, they would have had me in an office. Let me have it telling me that if I was to continue to talk to you, they would probably run me out and I would lose all hope whatsoever of being part of any of God's kingdom simply because he was talking to me at the time. And um, so I remember the day uh, after Brady started coming here, um, his main Jehovah's Witness guy came out to our house one day. And, of course, Brother Sterling and I lived next to each other. And Matthew and Paige lived there at the time, I think, and so on. And they come out, and I said, uh, who are you? He said, well, we're with the Kingdom Hall. I said, don't bother. Take this whole area off your list. And he said, oh, do you speak for everybody here? I said, yes, sir, I sure do. And I started walking toward him. I said, I sure do speak for everybody out here. And I said, I'm telling you, we're all good Christian people. And I said, you know Brady Crumb, don't you? Yes. I said, he's ours now. He's ours. He said, yeah. I said, so take us off your list and go on and get out of here. Boy, I was... Anyway, here's why I bring this up. Jehovah's Witness, change one word. One word. In John chapter 1, verse 1. And because they do that, they alter your, the entire outlook 
of how a person sees who Jesus Christ is. If you look at that verse, in the beginning was the word. It does not say in the beginning began the word. Because that, excuse me, that would mean that the word had a start, had a beginning. In the beginning was. When Jesus said before Abraham was, I am. And when he said that, the Pharisees ripped their clothes because they knew what he was saying. I am that I am. He was naming himself with the name of the Lord. And to them, that was blasphemy. They didn't know that that was his name. Okay, it had been hidden from them. So in the beginning was the word. It already was there, present, from the very moment that God spoke time into existence. Time comes into existence. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. The beginning is a time word. It shows you the beginning of all time. So John mirrors that in the beginning, the word already was. The word already was there. It was already, you know, which came first, the universe or the word that made the universe? The word that made the universe. You can't have a universe without the word to create the universe. Can't, Trump never built a building that didn't have a set of blueprints. Okay, or anybody else for that matter. So in the beginning was the word. It shows you his eternality in the past. He always was. Now, that blows my mind. Goes completely over my little head. I cannot comprehend eternity. None of us can. We all, because of where we live and the fact that we've lived here on this earth and it's governed by time, we cannot conceive of a place where time does not exist. We cannot think along those terms. It's either yesterday, it's either right now, or it's going to be tomorrow as far as our thinking is concerned. But in heaven, none of that exists. So sometimes you ask the question, what did God do? Before the creation. That even, even that question itself has absolutely no meaning because it assumes that God was bound by linear time before the creation and he wasn't. So in the beginning was the word and the word was with God. So we know we're talking about Jesus. And by the way, this is one of John's favorite terms for Christ, he's really the only one, the only apostle to call Jesus by this particular title. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God. So if you were to stop the verse there, you still don't have the word being equal with God. You don't have that there. You have him being with God, but in that sense, so are the angels. The angels are with God. They surround the throne of God. They, they cry out, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. They do that for all of eternity, which angels have never had COVID. Because if they had it, they wouldn't be able to say that for eternity. I know that. So I'm about out of breath now. But anyway, but the word was with God, meaning that at right, as of right now, he still could be an angel. But then, and the word was God. Now, the Bible's telling us, John is telling us, and then thus the Holy Ghost is telling us that Jesus Christ, who is the Word of God, is himself God. There is no ifs, ands, buts about it. There's no misunderstanding it unless you do what the Jehovah's Witness do in their New World Translation. They add A. And the word was A, God. Now let me explain that. This is, and I'm surprised that they don't have a convention 
every year of Gnostics and Jewish Kabbalists because they would their doctrine fits in perfectly together. Um, I don't know who developed it. I don't know where it came from. But at some point, people started, and this, this was around at the time of Christ, the belief that, yes, there is a God, He is the creator of everything, but because God is perfect, and because God is 100% spirit, God cannot have any contact with the material world. Does that phrase, material world, ring a bell? Who is it? Madonna. She sang a song called Material World. Why did she sing that song? Because she's one of the biggest students of the Kabbalah. And if you look at the lyrics of that song, she's a material girl in a material world. And part of Kabbalah and Gnostic teaching is that they believe that there is a humongous gap between the material world and the spiritual world where the what they what the Jews call the Ein Sof, the Gnostics call Sophia, uh, the epitome of wisdom, and that's a female word. Female Sophia, a goddess. But anyway, so they believe that God couldn't have created anything in the material world. He could not have done it because he cannot be exposed to material things. So God created a lesser God. But that lesser God still was not removed enough from God to create the universe. So that God created a lesser God who created a lesser God, who created a lesser God, and then one below him. So if you follow the Kabbalah, there's ten of them. And the tenth one, I guess, probably could have done it. But it's this, where Charles Taze Russell got his idea. He was the father of Jehovah's Witness. Remember, there is no new thing under the sun. It's always been around, no matter. It's always been around is that both the Jewish Kabbalists and the Gnostics who were around at the time of the writing of the Gospels, and before that, uh, because we know we have some of the Gnostic ideas inside the Dead Sea Scrolls, which we know were written prior to, um, I think, prior to the coming of Christ, all right? And some of the ideas were in those scrolls in there. But it's the idea that God could not have anything to do with matter or material or anything in this world. So he had to create a series of lesser gods. And finally he got the one he wanted, Jesus Christ. So when they add the word A to John 1.1, 1, 1, and the word was A, God, that's what they mean. They mean that God created a series of lesser gods until, that, until one of them finally created Jesus Christ. So, according to them, Jesus is created, but not the creator. Okay? So, that Jesus could then bring into being all of the material that's in the universe that you and I see. And again, I've said this before. Add that letter A to John 1.1 1, 1, and then embed that in your mind that according to that verse, Jesus is a created God. When you read the rest of the Bible, if that's firmly embedded in there, everything that you see, every verse that you see, you're always going to see Jesus as a lesser God, but not as equal with God. And remember, Paul said he thought it not robbery to be equal with God. He thought it not robbery. I'm not doing anything wrong. I'm God. Okay? Uh, we have, of course, um, our favorite verse, 1 John chapter 5, verse 1. 
King James has it. All of the other modern translations do not have it in there. Uh, 1 John 5, 7, For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word. Notice that John does not use the phrase the Son here. He chose to use the phrase the Word, which again, part of John's signature. Not only the idea of bear record was part of his signature, but calling Jesus by the title, the name, the Word. Um, and he does it again in Revelation. But anyway, the, for there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. And so John makes it very clear, and there is absolutely, I, 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 trust me, I got a B plus in Greek. There is absolutely no reason to add the letter A to John 1.1. Now, of course, I'm kidding about the Greek thing. But I'm telling you, there's no reason to do that. It's not there. It's just simply not there. They added it to it because it didn't match what they believed. Charles Taze Russell had a lot of problems. It started out with his problem that he had with hell. He did not. He would sit in sermons, hear sermons, did not like preachers preaching on hell. So he decided that since... They, everybody else was wrong. He was going to start his own little preaching whatever thing and eliminate hell out of it. But anyway, and the word was God. The phrase, the word, capital W, in your King James Bible is found exactly seven times. New Testament. Uh, John 1, 14, the word was made flesh. We looked at that verse. First John 1, 1. Turn there very quickly. And... and uh, these, like I say, this is John's favorite title of Christ. John, First uh, John, chapter one. That which was from the beginning. Notice, notice how John's phrasing this. That which was, you could say, already from the beginning. But that which was from the beginning. So it's what he's saying in John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the word. It was already there. It didn't just show up. It wasn't created so God could create the rest of the universe. It was the word that was already there. Um, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled. I like that part of that verse. Because it tells me that the word of God is not stuck up in heaven somewhere where we can't gain access to it. It's not in some pit somewhere hidden away. There's not some secret doctrine that God has hidden that he won't release until the end times. It's right here in our hands for us. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled of the word, again, capital W, of life. And then look at verse 2, same chapter. For the life was manifested and we have seen it and bear witness. There's John's phrase again. And shew unto you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested unto us, that which we have seen and heard, declare we unto you that ye also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. I like what the guy said, the son of a duck is a duck. The Son of God is God, amen. No difference whatsoever. Um, and I, I want to reiterate this again. At one point, while I was sick, you, you think, because you feel so rotten, you think maybe this is, this is going to end my life. You know, you just can't help but think that way. It plays on you psychologically, and I talked about that today. If I had anything to say to anybody, what would I say? Read your Bible. Read your Bible. I appreciate all the prayers, the well wishes, 
people saying, Pastor, we need you. I appreciate that. You have no idea how good that made me feel. But I'm not going to be here forever. I'm not going to be here forever. God's going to take me home like he's taken home millions of other people. When I'm gone, you still have the Bible to read. And God will show you what he wants to show you. God will teach you what he wants to teach you. God will tell you what he wants to tell you. God will, the Holy Ghost will guide you into all truth. He promised he would. He doesn't just do it through me and Reg Kelly and other pastors that we know, and Jason Hutzel, whatever. He doesn't just do it through us guys. You, I've said it before, you have as much right to read this Bible and believe it and know it as I do. In fact, I would say you have a greater responsibility to read and know and understand this Bible so that the guy behind the pulpit stays right in line with what's in this book. Somebody say amen. Um, and then I copied 1 John 1, 1 twice. I don't know why I did that. But Revelation, uh, I probably meant to put 1 John uh, 5, 7 there which is another instance of the word, capital W. And then turn to Revelation 19. This is John spelling it out in no uncertain terms. And I love this. Revelation chapter 19, verse 11. I saw heaven opened. To me, this is what separates this from the rapture. In the rapture, Jesus is coming clothed with clouds. It's going to be a cloudy day. But here the heaven is opened. And the clouds roll back, I guess, as a scroll or whatever. And behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called faithful. Look at that. And true. What, so whatever title you give and whatever name you give to Christ equally applies to what God said was equal to Christ, which is the Bible, the Word of God. The word of God is faithful. Even though we're not, God cannot lie. Think about 1 John 1, 9. That verse we use when we talk to people about the Lord. If we confess our sins, he is what? Faithful. Faithful. It means that God as a friend, as a, as a man to man, when God strikes a deal with you, when he shakes your hand and you, you two come to an agreement, you can guarantee that God's character is such is that he will never break that promise. He's faithful. But then it says he's just, which means that even if God might be inclined, which he's not, to there's something wrong in his character and he has a problem with keeping promises but he doesn't want to get in trouble so he'll do it just because the law makes him do it that's the just part god is faithful and god is just and in both of those god is not going to forsake what he said he would do he was going to forgive all of our sins if we would confess them somebody say amen amen, amen to that so anyway uh, he is called faithful and true, and, and that also applies to the Bible. Thy word is truth, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. And his eyes were as a flame of fire. And that's what John saw, Revelation chapter 1. And on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. How do you say that in Hebrew? The word of God. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> Yahushu shasha shasha. Uh, by the way, I, I mentioned this today. John saw it before I did. Uh, Jim Staley, the Hebrew roots guru, is out of prison. Um, he's not back making teaching videos again. I saw one video that he had made, him and his wife, and they're talking about how they're going to restart the ministry because basically his own ministry board kicked him out. His own board kicked him out um, because of the money stuff that was going on. 
And they said, we're not going to be part of this. Get out. And um, so anyway, he's going to restart his whole ministry again, all over again. And um, I, I suppose that there's going to be people that's going to funnel large amounts of money to him, just like they did in the past, and he's going to lie to them right straight through his teeth. Because he believes that you must do the works of the Torah in order to be saved. And if he calls me again and says he doesn't believe that, I'm going to call him a liar to his face. But anyway, his name is called the Word of God. There is absolutely no difference between the Lord and Savior Jesus that we worship, the one that we believe in, the one that we call unto, the one that we look to, the one who is our counselor. There's no difference between Jesus and our Bibles. If Jesus is ever wrong, our Bible's going to be wrong. And if our Bible's ever wrong, then Jesus is going to be wrong. He's not fa if, if our Bible's wrong, Jesus cannot be faithful and he cannot be true. Truth by its very definition, even though Pontius Pilate had no idea what truth is. What is truth? Truth by its very definition is it has absolutely no addition of error, lies, incomplete facts, Nothing. It is 100% true. His name is called the Word of God. I would gladly call him that out of praise and honor to him. Somebody say amen. Just the phrase Word of God 49 times in the King James Bible, 7 times 7. The phrase Word of the Lord 245 times in the Old Testament, that's 7 times 35. 35 is seven times five. So you got 49 times five with the phrase word of the Lord, word of God, the word of the Lord, the word, capital W, all of them, all of them referring to Jesus Christ and the spirit of Christ that was in the prophets back in the Old Testament. Psalm 1830, as for God, his way is perfect. Look at this. The word of the Lord is tried. He is a buckler to all those that trust in him. Psalm 33, 4, for the word of the Lord is right and all his works are done in truth. Psalm 33, 6, by the word of the Lord, look at here, were the heavens made and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. It was by the word of God. He spoke those things into existence and they came to be. When God says something, it happens and all the gates of hell itself cannot prevail against it. I uh, don't have time to move on tonight. Uh, we'll get into a little bit about the creation aspect of the Word of God next Wednesday night. All right.